May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning, friends. Welcome, welcome on this beautiful, lovely day to Pleasant Hill Community Church, where we like to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we do mean that sincerely, whether you're here with us in person this morning or you're joining us online, you are always welcome here. In announcements this morning, today is World Communion Sunday, and uh, this is a very special day because churches all over the world will be celebrating communion together, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, Also, I would like to uh, lift up that this evening, the Justice and Mission will be showing a documentary, Bad Faith. And this is on the history of Christian nationalism. This is going to occur at 6.30 p.m. in Ad's Head. I did watch this documentary a couple of weeks ago. It is very much something that you want to see. I, I went home after our Braver Angels workshop and watched it first thing. And it is definitely something that we all need to be aware of. So please, if you're able to join us for that, please do. Uh, Wednesday evening, Vesper ser- service. We had our first service last Wednesday. This is um, an, a homegrown organic effort that we have started. There's a small team of us who are rotating and taking turns leading the Vesper service. It is to be a very uh, traditional, yet also very contemporary, uh, contemporary type of service that is of a contemplative nature, and we are just kind of experimenting with different <clears throat> theologies, different philosophies, different approaches, different forms of spirituality. Like I said, it's right now very uh, open as to what it will be. It's an evolving thing. But everybody is welcome to this. And if you know people outside of the church who are looking for a way to uh, connect spiritually without all of the, um, the formality of going to church every week, I think that this might be something that they would be interested in. So please come and check it out. We had nine of us there the last time, and it was a very, very fulfilling time that we had together. And then finally, our next uh, community conversation is going to be on October 20th. And we're very excited about this conversation. We're going to have a cold luck as opposed to a potluck. And what that means is we'll be bringing cold dishes that we don't have to plug in our crock pots or anything. And it'll make it a little bit simpler for all of us as far as cleanup and making sure that the food is hot and prepared and everything. So please, please put that on your calendar and be there. Uh, We will be talking about um, roots and fruits of money. So this should be a very interesting conversation. And with that, we will go ahead and extend to one another the blessing of Christ's peace. Peace be with you.
Won't you join me in the call to worship? Come, let us gather in the one unifying spirit, the spirit of God and the church throughout the world. There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and creator of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Come, let us gather in the one unifying spirit. Let us gather in unity with our sisters and brothers throughout the world. And continuing together our opening prayer, redeeming God, as we gather in worship on this World Communion Sunday, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. We pray for your spirit to awaken new hope in us. Grant us the vision to see the coming of your kingdom. Help us to celebrate the glimpse of grace that you have given to each of us. Knit our hearts together in worship and communion so that we may know the struggle alone in working for your peace and justice. We pray for this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, if you're able, I invite you to stand and let's sing together our opening hymn. Please be seated. Not sure what happened there, but. <laughs> and now we will enter into our time of centering. And during this time, we take a moment to set aside all of the cares and concerns that we bring with us into the sanctuary, and we set them aside. And we just breathe and we just be and we recognize that we are always in the presence of God. Sometimes we just have to take a moment and set everything aside and clear things out so that we can receive that presence. So let us begin by breathing, breathing deep. You might want to close your eyes or fixate on a point in the room. There is a trough in waves, a low spot where horizon disappears, and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way unless we rest 
knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again. There we may drown if we let fear hold us within its grip and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disappointed. But if we rest there in the trough, are silent, being with the low part of the wave, keeping our energy and noticing the shape of things, the flow, the time alone will bring us to another place where we can see horizon, see the land again, regain our sense of where we are and where we need to swim. Amen. And now let's join together with our collect prayer. Open now our ears, O God, that we might hear your word. Open now our minds, O God, that we might receive your word. Open now our hearts, O God, that we might accept your word and make it the rule of our lives. Our scripture readings this morning are <clears throat> begin with a, a reading from the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter, the first 13 verses. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A year old male, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the lamb that same night they shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn with fire. This is how you shall eat it your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from human to animal and to all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then our second reading, also from Exodus, but chapter 13, the first eight verses. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, 
Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the Israelites of human beings and animals is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out, and when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there should be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You shall, te you shall tell your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And our final scripture for this morning is from the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 22, the 14th through the 20th verse. Jesus said, when the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Here ends the reading. There is a traditional question asked at the beginning of each Passover celebration by the youngest child in the family. Why is this night different from any other night? In response, the father answers the question with the telling of the Passover story, and I think that this is a great place to begin our celebration of World Communion Sunday because the first Christians were Jews. And in order to fully appreciate the Eucharist, it helps to have an understanding of the Jewish Passover. Our sacrament of Holy Communion goes all the way back to Egypt, at least 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus to the time of Moses, who on the night in question is trying to sneak over one million people across the border and out of Egypt before Pharaoh notices. Pharaoh had enslaved the Israelites, and God had called on Moses to go and fetch them. And there had been a lot of negotiating in the form of plagues. Nine times Moses had been sent trudging back to the bargaining table with Pharaoh, and nine times Pharaoh had refused to let the people go. Nine times plagues were delivered in Egypt, each one worse than the last, yet still Pharaoh refused. And now the tenth and worst plague was bearing down on them, and this would be the crushing blow. This would be the coup de grace. But there was one very important detail. 
If the Israelites did not want to be victims of the plague, they would need to perform a special ritual so that the plague would pass over them. And this ritual had some very specific steps that had to be followed to the letter by everyone, all one million of them. Step one, each household was to select an unblemished lamb, wait four days to make sure that it was pure, whatever that means, and then sacrifice it by cutting its throat. Step two. They were to smear blood on the lintel and the doorposts of each house, cook the lamb a specific way, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Step three, the entire meal was to be consumed with loins girded, sandals on feet, staffs in hand, so that everyone would be ready to depart at a moment's notice. Step four, if there were any leftovers, burn them. Once this was accomplished, the angel of death came for all firstborn children, but passed over the houses that had been marked, which spared the Israelites, but devastated the Egyptians. And it worked. Pharaoh told Moses to take his people and get out. And that strange little meal with its very specific set of instructions, became known as the Passover meal, which God commanded the people to celebrate every year as a reminder of God's faithfulness. The Passover meal, over time, became the setter, a celebration of joy and expectation, of retelling and reflection, and a time of tremendous preparation. Before the ceremony, the house must be completely stripped of all leavening agents and byproducts. In other words, anything that puffs up when cooked must be removed, such as breads and cakes, as well as anything that gives rise to these in foods, including baking powder, baking soda, and yeast. Another one of the customs of the setter is the afikoman. Early in the meal before the Exodus story is read, the leader breaks a piece of unleavened bread in half, and the larger piece, or a fecalman, is hidden. After the meal, the children are sent to find the hidden piece, and once found, it is broken up, distributed, and eaten by everyone at the setter. Wine is also a part of the meal, with the same cup being filled four times throughout the ceremony. It's a real party. In this Passover celebration, this setter was a part of Jesus' identity as a Jew. All of the gospel writers agree. Jesus and his disciples were together for a meal the same night that he was arrested. All three of the synoptic gospel writers claim the meal was a Passover meal. Luke's gospel in particular states that Jesus sent disciples ahead of him to prepare the Passover meal because the house where they were to eat needed to be cleansed of all leaven. And it is here in Luke's gospel where we encounter Jesus this morning sharing the Passover meal with his disciples. Only this time, it's different. This time, Jesus uses the imagery of the Passover meal to institute a new meal, a meal to remember him by. As they ate the meal, said the prayers, and lit the candles, along with every other family in Judea, as they took the wine and the unleavened bread, It was with his breaking of the bread and his blessing of the cup that Jesus formed and transformed them into a new family in him. And in that moment, just as countless generations of Israelites had been drawn into this defining story of God's faithfulness, all followers of Christ became part of the Passover story. So, why is this meal different from every other meal? You might recognize this question. 
This meal is different from every other meal because it's a meal shared by the communion of saints. When we eat this meal, we sit at the table with all who have gone before us and all who will come after us. This meal takes place outside of time as well as inside of it. I eat this meal with my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents. I eat it with my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. I eat it with Peter and Paul and Mary Magdalene and with Jesus. We share this meal with those who might hate or despise us or those who we might hate or despise for whatever reasons, be they political or humanitarian or just because. We share this meal with people we think or our enemies. We share this meal with people we genuinely dislike. Gathering at this table means we have to lay down our weapons and pick up the bread and the cup. It means that we have to acknowledge that we are all children of God. Why is this meal different from every other meal? This meal is different because it calls us more deeply into communion with God. Eating is sensual. It is wordless. It is experiential. It calls us to use all of our senses to hear the tearing of the bread and the wine being poured from the pitcher into the cup. It calls us to smell the rich yeast and the sweet tang and to feel the texture of the bread and the smoothness of the cup. And finally, it calls us to taste and see how good God is as we take God into our bodies. This meal is different because it is a sacrament of grace a sacrament that brings real people divided in the larger world into an intimate flesh and blood embrace where there shall be no difference between us. There is a hunger beyond food that makes eating together a kind of a miracle. When we eat together, we bring together all the fragments of our individual lives and we experience communion we move from being separate to being one. And we recognize a truth that we often take for granted. The table and the fragments that become one extend all the way around the world. Whether it be in a great cathedral with a choir and robes and incense and processions or on a beach with an upturned crate as a table, whether it be in English or Latin, Swahili or Chinese, whether in sorrow or joy, in gratitude or hope, Christians have gathered for 2,000 years to share the sacrament that has united us as the body of Christ. Why is this meal different from every other meal? Because at this meal, we become a living communion The church is called to be the body of Christ in the world. And this meal reminds us what that means. Sometimes it means sacrifice. Sometimes it means remembering for ourselves and reminding others that we are all children of God. Sometimes it means that we make space for peace between us in a world where it seems there is no peace. There is something about hunger, whether physical or spiritual, that fills us with longing. And as the body of Christ or the hands and feet of Jesus working together, we can feed and nourish both. Why is this meal different from every other meal? Because at the table of Jesus, nothing that we can do matters. We can only receive When we come to his table, we're all needy people with our mouths open and our hands outstretched to receive. And he says to us, all of you, take and drink. All of you, Peter, Judas, all of you, drink deeply. I love you. You may not be welcome anywhere else, but you're welcome always at my table. The Last Supper is really our first supper. 
Because when we drink deeply of that cup, it shapes the rest of our lives and every other meal that we eat. The cup he gives to us is the love and forgiveness poured out of the beating heart of God. And no matter how often we share it with others, and no matter who comes to the table, that cup will never run dry. What we find here at this table where we eat the same food and drink the same cup is the precious living community, the people of God, you, the body of Christ, alive and at work in our world. It began with 12 close friends sitting around a Passover meal with the teacher that they had grown to love and follow. They didn't know it was to be their last meal together. They didn't see what was coming even as he broke the bread, passed the cup, and asked them to continue doing it in remembrance of him. But they did as he asked, and for 2,000 years, millions of Christians all over the world have gathered week by week, month by month, year by year, to remember him through the gift of his special meal. And so as we gather around our own table in unison with all the other tables encircling the globe, let us give thanks to our God by joining hands and walking together along the rocky and rugged path to the vineyard. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord for this gift of grace, and may it be with you all according to God's word. Amen. And now we will join together in singing our next hymn, Jesus Took the Bread, and please rise as you're able.
Please be seated. <clears throat> this morning, we are lifting up from Fletcher, Jean and Jeannie Kingsbury, who is having problems, uh, pain with her knee, and she's asking that we pray for relief for that. And I would now extend to you the invitation to lift up any prayers that you might have this morning for those in your life who are in need of prayer. Yes, Jan. For Kathy, who lost her longtime closest friend on Friday night when Phil died. Karen. For peace in the world and our community with vigil for peace at the courthouse at 12 o'clock, 12.30 tomorrow. It'll be peaceful and on a regular basis on Mondays, 12 to 12.30. 12 to 12.30 on Monday, tomorrow. There's going to be a gathering to pray for peace. It's a vigil, a prayer vigil. And I believe you said you were going to be doing it every Monday. So this is going to be an ongoing thing, which is very much needed right now. <clears throat> At the courthouse, yes. <clears throat> I'm assuming you can talk to Karen after worship to find out more. Yes, Carolyn. For new life, a new great grandson. Oh, Augustus. wonderful. Augustus. A new great grandson, Augustus. Whoa, very rude. <laughs> wonderful. We lift that up. Yay. Yes, Diantha. Absolutely. We are so glad to see you here and know that you're okay. I remember this time last week I was frantically trying to get a hold of you. So, I, I also want to lift up. A lot of people have asked me, uh, do we have an effort put together to, to help those affected by the hurricane? Currently, there's a lot of confusion, and so we're trying to go directly through the church who we know will direct the resources to the right place. These people have a lot of experience with uh, responding to disasters. So if you go to our Facebook page, uh, there is a post that tells you how you can click on the link and it'll take you to where you need to be to find out what you need to know about how we can respond to the hurricane. I would also lift up Mary Lou, Matt, and Ben, since uh, Sue is gone for the week. <laughs> I don't want to let her down. I did last week, but let us pray silently. Gracious God, grace us now with your presence as we quietly and loudly pray to you. May we see in each other your light, your love, and you. May it not matter our differences, our names, our languages, our looks, and our way of doing things. May what matters today and every day be 
that we are one in you. And as we pray, we call to mind our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us today, whether in body or spirit. May you bring comfort to those who are grieving, lonely, heartbroken, ill, or broken of spirit. May you strengthen those whose lives feel shattered, don't make sense in crises and experiencing loss. May you say the healing words to those who need it. May you bring the human touch of love to those who have not been touched. May you love the unloved through us. May you shine your light into those whose world is covered in darkness. May you use us to feed the hungry, clothe the ones who need clothes, give a cup of water to those who are thirsty, shelter the homeless, visit the sick and those in prison. May lives be awakened to you, dear God to your love, and to your kingdom, whose doors always open to all. In the name of Jesus, we pray, saying the words together, Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time in our service where we continue our, our worship by bringing our financial gifts so that we may reach beyond just this community to help meet the needs of people, many of whom, probably most of whom, we won't know in person. Now, if you're here in the sanctuary, you may have already dropped your offering in uh, one of the plates by each of the entrances, or there's one here on the table. If you're worshiping with us online, please go to our website, PleasantHillUCCTN.org, where you'll find a tab for giving there. And today we're, reach, we're not only gathering our regular offerings to do a wide variety of work, but today's the day we can bring our Neighbors in Need special offering. So if you have not already made a contribution to support Neighbors in Need, this is a time that you can do that as well. So let us give thanks for all that we have received and give thanks for the opportunity to share some of that with others as we listen to the music.
Won't you pray with me? Gracious God, we give thanks for this opportunity to share a portion of what we have received so that others may be blessed. Use these gifts as you will to, for the benefit of others and for the joy it gives us in being your partner in this way. Amen. To your table, you bid us come. You have set the places, you have poured the wine. And there is always room, you say, for one more. And so we come. From the streets and from the alleys, we come. From the deserts and from the hills, we come. From the ravages of poverty and from the palaces of privilege, we come. Running, limping, carried, we come. We are bloodied with our wars. We are wearied with our wounds. We carry our dead within us, and we reckon with their ghosts. We hold the seeds of healing. We dream of a new creation. We know the things that make for peace, and we struggle to give them wings. And yet to your table we come, hungering for your bread we come, thirsting for your wine, we come, singing your song in every language, speaking your name in every tongue, in conflict and in communion, in discord and in desire, we come, O oh God of wisdom, we come. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us now give thanks to God. Loving and gracious God who summons galaxies into being, we give thanks and blessing to you. We bless you for our world. The diversity of our planet amazes us from the prairies and the pampas of the Americas to the dusty deserts of Africa and Asia, from the mountains, the majestic mountains of Europe, to the vast outback of Australia, we give you thanks for the multiplicity of humanity within our complexity of color and culture, yet called into oneness of being through Christ. Loving and gracious God who surrounds creation with abundant love, we give thanks and blessings to you. We bless you for your love made known to us through Jesus, which reassures and reconciles us to you, to ourselves, and to one another. As Christ is our light to you, may we be lights to others, illuminating the path toward communion with you, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus, our friend and brother. Amen. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared his last meal with his friends. He took the bread, he broke it, and he passed it among them, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Eat it and remember me. In the same manner, they took the cup after supper, and as he poured, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, Poured in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it and remember me. And so we take, we eat, we drink, and we remember that there is no greater love than the love of Christ for us. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again come, for all things have been made ready. You're first.
Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this holy meal. Thank you for Jesus and his all-inclusive love for humanity. And thank you for this day which we worship and serve you. Amen. And now let us join together in our closing hymn sent forth by God's blessing. And please rise as you're able. a very short word before we close. Sure. I just wanted to express my appreciation, and I think yours too, for the beautiful visuals that are part of our worship today. Joy Lynn is the one who not only created this, but this stunning banner as well. So I just wanted to let you know, if you didn't, she's responsible. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. I made that for you all. It was an outpouring of my heart that just came to me, and I'm so thrilled to see it hanging here, and thank you. And now, will you please join me in our closing prayer? Oh Lord, may I so live that those who know me and know not thee may want to know thee because they know me. Amen. Go now with God's wisdom and strength to guide you as you proclaim the love of Christ through thought, word, and deed. In the name of the creator, sustainer, and redeemer, one God, mother of us all. Amen.
We are so glad you could join us this morning at Pleasant Hill Community Church. We'd like you to invite you to join us in person if you are in the area. Join us for our meet and greet time at 945 before the service to talk with members and friends and then worship with us at 1030 each Sunday morning. All of God's people are welcome to our service. No matter where you are at in your life's journey, you're welcome here. To find more about who we are, please go to our website at pleasanthillucctn.org or see us on our Facebook page. Until next week, thank you for worshiping with us this morning.